Hello, I'm Gary Allen, and welcome to a new project. This backyard setting provides some interesting challenges for us. With the pool addition, deck, and new sidewalk, our goal here is to control the drainage, decorate this out-of-ground septic mound, and so much more. We look forward to the changes we'll make here today. So talk about challenges. Uh, many people do have above ground septic tanks or drain fields in their yard. How can we turn this eyesore into a plus, into an accent piece that uh, really makes it inviting? Well, what we have in mind, and try to visualize this, a curvature stone wall with steps going up well landscaped to offer it as an invitation rather than something so close to the pool that it's out of place. In this small setting, it's going to really be a challenge for us. Again, just because we're squared off here doesn't mean we have to keep to that pattern. We'll use the curve wall process and kind of step down and terrace to show you what you can do with mounds, whether it's a septic tank or just a change in grade. This crepe myrtle here has uh, survived the installation of the pool and it's doing quite well. So we'll keep him in place as our wall will terrace or tear down to go from this raised level down to zero or the existing grade. Now, wouldn't some people just come in and install turf grass all around the pool? We can do better than that. Matter of fact, we want to limit the mowing that throws grass clippings onto the deck and into the pool as much as possible. So we will have some smooth turf grass lines through here for stabilization and control of any type of erosion. But again, the idea is to not just mow all around the pool. We can use plants to help decorate, use the fence as a backdrop, and kind of pull all that together. Now you see this new patio deck also uh, we suggested to the homeowners that we install this sidewalk that goes to another side entrance of the garage and all the way to the drive. We feel like this walkway, well it already has, begun to add function and traffic pattern to the back pool. So can you see the trees and plants added already that are going to make it look better? Well, we certainly hope so. Now, with our segmental stone retaining wall and that concept, let me get my paint gun marker and we'll try to draw out some of these new curved walls, if you will, and see how they shape up. So let's see how things shape up. Now, we do not have a plan for this. It's really a design build concept, but our challenge is that with this stake, this is the inside or outside of the drain field area. So we have this this space to work with. Rather than straighten this along the deck, we may swerve this out around this a little bit and pick up the wall coming out and probably right through here. Again, I think our point of impression is that we want to use a curved pattern rather than just a straight wall. And with the segmental concrete retaining wall process, we can do that effectively. Okay, so this will be kind of a three foot wall there. But we want to come down here, I think, in other words, having another planter bed come towards you that'll be of a lower height. And this will act as a terrace or again, another planter made out of the same stone. We may even put a tree either inside or inside the planter box for accent. So we're curving out, then we've got a maple tree there and our wall will radiate from here, come down and touch on this side of the tree. Now you see this section I'm walking on, that will remain turf. In other words, we're going to have the grass come down and roll down to the sidewalk. Then another wall that will go around the fence here to stabilize the big drop or change in grade we have there. Now, while the guys are uh, taking out the unwanted grass on the other side, I thought I'd bring you on this other side of the pool and we draw a little game plan here. Our turf grass, uh, the amount that we use to control the erosion is gonna be uh, really the first impression. 
And since this walk is a little bit narrow, instead of having plants along here, I think the turf grass is going to help it feel uh, like you've got more space. And so we will have grass right along here. And as we curve, we'll end that turf. In other words, I'll begin a bed there and the grass comes along following with me. And then I'm going to do what I call just like a little gumdrop, a circular pattern that radiates and brings us back home because we've got to reach out here, keep that tree inside a bed. So we'll meander along this line. And then we've got these big cassias that are in place and doing their job. So the grass will peel inside here. Then a couple more objects. I mean, at least we can see what the homeowner was used to mowing around all these independent or individual things. So, matter of fact, when we get to this point, the homeowner has stressed uh, the fact or opportunity that we'd like to do some screening here. So maybe a large shrub that gets up and does some hiding, another tree for us to come and include inside a bed, which means that we'll take out the grass here, convert that to a planting. Along the pool side, some plants here for to hide some of the hardware section of the home, our pool service station, and then this tree. So you can see a planting here with turf grass leading up to the deck. That'll give us really an opportunity to traffic in or off around here pretty well. Now, um, we are removing some of the extra grass and then we'll be ready to bring some of the dirt out, graded in preparation for our retaining wall. I thought I would bring you indoors with me to the design board. When it comes to drawing landscape design symbols, I found a couple easy methods. Of course, you can work on different symbols that may be easy for you to draw, but where do you begin? Come on up a little closer and I'll show you some things I've learned and maybe pass them on to you. Naturally, we make use of the basic symbol, which is a circle. Everything evolves from that, really. You see the difference in these two trees. Uh, this one has a thin line that we've gone around three times versus a bolder or thicker pin with a dot or a full circle in the center. Again, this could represent a deciduous tree and this may be an evergreen tree, but we've also got these little symbols along the side, some with hatching and some without, that differentiate or show that this is one particular plant and this may be a different variety altogether. So what I've done is basically uh, taken a sheet of paper and I've uh, drawn fine little pencil lines that I use for our outline. And so now we'll come in with use of ink and let's start with a thick, bold line first. With my circular pattern, I'm gonna use that as an outline, follow along and just jet in, if you will, at different little juts or links, see, until I go all the way around the circle. Then I can put any type of uh, symbol to denote the tree or the center. Now, what if we're drawing this symbol as a shrub? Well, if you slide over here, we'll use that same symbol with this outline So we see this symbol used as a, a ground bed cover and as a tree. Well, let's continue. This time we'll use a thin line, if you will. I'll start here and we'll use a hollow circle for the center. This one I call like a Geiger counter. You see how you just follow with an etched line and jet in towards the center again. Now this is really the same principle, but look how using a fine tooth pin or a fine point pin, I mean, versus a thick point, you really get a, a difference of two different textures. Again, we want to use just the circular pattern. I'm going to outline the circle, and then I'm going to come in and weave in and outside to create a soft or a little uh, dainty feel, if you will. And then for here, I'll use like an asterisk to represent the tree trunk. And again, we have a different symbol, with the, but with a fine textured pin. 
Now, another symbol, let me slide you over to a ground cover, is I find when you outline your bed type and you want to come in with a variety of plants, see how I'm doing this little scallop mark or half circle in a medium type of size? So, I hope those are some ideas that will help get you started. One thing you'll find comes in handy is a circular template of all these different varieties of sizes. And you'll find that practice makes perfect. Now, while you've been away, we've been hard at work. Matter of fact, we finished the completion of the installed wall here. We'll catch up with Charles later to show us what all has gone in uh, to this project getting us to this point. Uh, stabilization now. And what do you think? I even like this rear wall here with the curves. We've done a couple things. Again, we mentioned stabilizing the dif distance of the two grades, but we've done it in a manner that is really attractive. You've got three different stone sizes here, 18, 12s, and 6, and so that odd size really makes the wall look um, a little more antique, if you will. It is our goal now to, again, make this picture look even better or to enhance it, so to speak. Uh, friends, if you remember, this tree was existing, this maple, and it has really uh, played an important or influential role in how we've developed the design of the wall here. We had to keep the grade open, so the wall in actuality comes behind with our grass ramp up, and we look forward to decorating this. What do you think about our multi-level tier here? The small little planter that radiates off the other curve. Now, we don't want to come in here with a bunch of tall plants and hide the wall. Our goal will be to accent it. So I really envision lower usage or usage of lower growing varieties in here as an accent. One, two, three East Palatka holly trees. We'll also light those up at night in order to really form a focal here. So behind our one East Palatka holly, two, are the steps. We've secluded them a little bit. And all we have to install here are the caps, and this will finish it off, but it adds function uh, to the desire of wanting to get up on what is an old drain field or a septic mound. Oh, do you remember we had in existence this crepe myrtle tree, a white, and at the homeowner's request, we've added two more, one in the center and one on the left uh, to kind of complete our pool, our pool tree planting, if you will. Since we're still talking about trees, this existing red maple was so attractive that we decided to mimic it by purchasing a few more. And over to your left here, we have one red maple and another one on the inside and outside of the fence. Now, another thing I like about this angle or this view, the homeowner has chosen this open fence look, which really doesn't block us. It lets us utilize all this area together to work as an entrance, both coming in and going out. So remember too, we're not going to let this fence dictate the plant shapes on the inside and the outside. We can meander through the fence itself because we can see through it and that is going to work. I want to draw some lines here and begin setting up some initial concepts. It's my desire now to really outline some concepts for you. We do not have a, a planting plan, but a couple points of impression I want to put in your mind, and that is that we have plants, you've seen us do this before, that somehow cross over or meander down a long stretch or sidewalk like this. So again, and I don't mean that we're going to use just one variety here. We may have things spinning off, like, like uh, I may create a little inside circle for these one, two, three planters that gives us some movement there. But the idea is we may start and stop other varieties, continuing to cross over the walk, let's say more than one time, okay? So again, that kind of gives us an outline. What I want you to do too is see how we develop the overall plan, how it ends up, plant that in your mind. Now, if you can see behind me, we have a light or an off-white house, a light or off-white retaining wall. Well, plant color then and contrast is gonna be important. Let me grab a few varieties and uh, we'll talk for a moment. 
All right, we've set up for you some do's and don'ts. However, there are no rules. I mean, even though I might not do this, uh, you can. Again, no rules here. Uh, with the light colored brick, we brought in the Snow Queen hibiscus and you see the light color there and the variegated border grass or the Aztec grass. Uh, these are all light and so there's no contrast built in. If you'll come over here, you see what a difference the dark green tea olive make against the light surface. Now we can still come in now that we've painted the green picture and come in with our next layer being variegated. Look at even how the roses with the green color foliage and the pinkish color of the flower, it, it almost ties in really well. So that's again a choice, but we might not put that on the wall. We're going to have Dan come in and change these out just to take the Aztec from light to dark and we'll come back and look at that. Now here's some other colors we have in the landscape when we talk about contrast because these colors are permanent year round. The bluish green color of the low juniper, and this is why we use, in this case, Blue Pacific. But it's a beautiful blue cast that stays that way in January and in July. And look at the burgundy, the rich color of the Laura Petalum. This contrast will work on any light color surface. Then you could come in with a variegated color on the front of it, or really anything. See, this gives you a choice to come back with green or what have you. Up here, Look at the glossy deep green with the little uh, bronze kind of tip that the clay era japonica has. A beautiful plant that'll grow a little taller. So we might use it again where this wall meets our other wall and we want to kind of hide or soften that a little bit. Moving on down the line, look at the beautiful glossy green color, the beautiful glossy green color of the uh, gardenia radicans with the flower that's also fragrant. And then up top, the low harbor dwarf Nandina, another bluish cast, as you see in some of this foliage here. So a blue-green to work with. Now, uh, the Kunti palms that we have give us a tropical splash also around the pool. And let's let you work down and at least show you uh, what we've come up with here. You see how the dark green tea olive, the variegation could come in front of there with the Aztec. And then, like we said, Dan set this up where we still have lighter green but dark. A little bit darker with the evergreen giant. I still think we need improvement there. With the clay air or something really deep glossy green, it gives us a building backdrop. If you have a dark colored house or wall, then the variegation can be a place to start. With the light color, you want to start with dark. If you'll give us a moment or two, and we're going to set up some things, maybe even put a few plants in the ground, then we'll take a walk and see how things have developed. It's kind of interesting to me that the, the Laura Petalum is playing the biggest role of our contrast picture. The green looks good. The, actually, the Aztec grass is kind of disappearing on us a little bit, so we've got to line it with green on one side and green on another. Of course, I think you'll see when we get things mulched, it'll, everything will stand back out. Uh, we've been busy, not only setting up, but installing. The Laura Petalum in the back, the Kunti Palm under here, front center with this little uh, lower planter, if you will, and then some color. We've used actually two varieties of lantana, the Anne Marie with the fuchsia kind of purple and gold, and then the gold lantana at the base. Again, keeping low varieties so that this picture stays open. Even under the tree here and accenting the steps, I think the African iris uh, looks good as a border on both sides, setting us up. Now, what do you say we go catch up with our wall contractor here and see what all it took to build this retaining wall? Uh, friends, I'd like you to meet Charles O'Neill with O&O Construction. Uh, Charles had the wonderful job of uh, building our retaining wall. Right. And what a fine job you've done. Tell us a little bit about the construction process. Uh, first, you start with your height of the wall. You got to figure out uh, how much footer you have to get into the ground. Okay. Uh, you dig your footers, it's about six inches thick of uh, rock that you have to put in. How, how big a footer did we have on this? Uh, six inches thick by two foot wide. Two foot wide. Right. So uh, nice and, wide base. Right. And we, we get rid of all the dirt. We take our filter cloth. It's a fabric that keeps the soil from penetrating into the rock. Uh, we lay the filter cloth into the hole and we bring a rock in. and. Uh, get it to the grade that we need and take a compactor, a plate compactor, and run the 
compact rover. And yeah, you're, you're actually like building a foundation then to, uh, to right. put your first course on. Huh? Right. Yeah. And the first course, uh, all these blocks, they come with a lip on the back of them uh -huh. that uh, keep the block from sliding out. That keeps Lock them together. Them in. Sure. Yes, sir. Uh, you have to knock those off on your first course. Uh huh. So that block will set level. Set level in, onto the rock bed, right? Now, is, uh, I noticed it was a large gravel. Uh, you got 57 stone. And what the the significance of that? Right. It's to help for the drain to get the water from behind the wall, so it won't create a lot of pressure. Good. Uh, okay. So the water should percolate, percolate. Un down underneath and out through right. the, the, out face through the of front. The wall. Yes. Good. Good. So what comes next? I mean, you mentioned the compactor. Right. And we, we knock the, the lip off that first block that uh -huh. goes in the, on top of the rock. We lay them all out and try to get the right shape that we want. Okay. And then we have to shoot them all to the right grade with a transit level. Uh, each one of them, each individual block is shot to make sure it's the right height. Very That's good. the most important part of uh, building these walls. Yeah, see, um, uh, you know, when I've done some of these walls, we, we leveled each block as we went. I noticed you laid your blocks out and then you tweaked them into space. Right. into place right. and you got the right shape we did all that in one step so with that first course down you mentioned how important that is to be level right and then things just kind of come up from there yeah it's uh, uh it's a lot of a lot of labor intense work uh it's heavy block some the uh, the biggest block weighs about 70 pounds uh so it gets to your back quite a bit yeah well then i might ask you charles uh, how would you rate this project um, difficulty wise from uh, zero to five, five being the most difficult uh, for a homeowner. How would you gauge that? For a homeowner, uh, this type of wall, probably about a four, mm -hmm. four and a half. Mm -hmm. was, you had three man crew or so, right. and our guys helping out yes, too. Sir. And so for one homeowner team, I guess that would be kind of yeah, rough it would too. It would be very rough. Yeah. Quite a few weekends. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, yeah. And so um, then the steps, uh, which I threw into the mix, uh, tell us about the steps. Uh, the steps, what we did was we left the first course going around and we brought the second course and brought it back behind the first course, created a little alcove. Okay. And we each course we did that coming back, incorporated the steps into the wall. Yeah, usually I've seen it where, you know, you'd have to turn a corner back. Like a box. Uh-huh. Right. We didn't have enough room because of the drain field. Mm -hmm. So we had to uh, improvise, kind of improvise there. a little bit. But really, you did a beautiful job. And the steps are now uh, functional. I know the homeowners right. enjoy them. And they're visual, visually attractive. Right. So it does look it, nice. It really makes sense. I appreciate, too, uh, the caps and how that finishes everything off. Right. Yeah, it has the same texture as the block has on the face and the back so it can be exposed on both sides and still look like the same product. Now those are kind of cut into space to make sure you have a real tight fit on them. Right, on this type of wall it had, had the curves in it so we had to practically cut almost uh, every block wow. to get it to fit on top. And uh, those are attached then in what way? Uh, we have a construction adhesive. Uh, each one of them are, are glued down with exterior uh, glue. So no loose caps and the wall will then from right, that point solid, on solid. solid. So you've got your filter cloth to uh, not allow any seepage of right. soil or unwanted. Right. That keeps Block it compacted. nice and clean with time. Right. And really a, a design build concept. So I really appreciate uh, from a designer standpoint, I got to see my vision uh, come to life. Right. Uh, thanks to you and your crew. Yeah. So really, I know this wall is going to be here for a long time. The homeowners are uh, tickled with it. Now we just want to decorate it so it makes your work look even better. Right. Charles, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Oh, by the way, we need to restate. Before you begin reconstruction on a septic or drain field, check with your city, local, or county codes to make sure you're within their guidelines. So, go back with me, won't you? And let's reflect on the construction of this project. Enjoy some befores and afters. We have certainly enjoyed this project, turning an eyesore into an asset. I'm Gary Allen. I'll see you next time.